All right. Um, so this is Math 105. This is Intermediate Algebra. Um, welcome to the class. Um, so this is the start of the course. This is the start of Chapter 1. Um, you could find these notes on Canvas, but this is my first recorded lecture for section 1.1. Um, so in this section we're going to look at qualitative graphs to describe situations. Um, so <clears throat> one of the big things you're going to see in this course, um, one of the big things you're going to see in this class is, you know, when we first start off talking about algebra, this is an intro to algebra course. This gets you, you know, the intention of this course is to get you acclimated to the rules of algebra. Um, you know, you learn the basic building blocks of uh, doing basic algebraic properties. Um, so, one of the most first fundamental things we look at is, um, you know, we look at relationships between two variables or we look at relationships between two situations and that's what we mean by describing situations here so you know when I fill in these notes and when I you know I, I'm gonna fill in the gaps a little bit by jotting things down and you know I do encourage you to write those down if you decide to take these notes on your own I have blank copies online and you could always refer to this video if you ever get confused and you can always ask me questions um, all right, so what is a qualitative graph? So a qualitative graph, now it, a, qual, a qualitative graph does not contain scales. It does not contain scaling. So what do I mean by that is does, it does not contain numbers. It does not contain numbers at all. Um, <clears throat> We'll look at sketches or, you know, numerical graphs a little bit later, but the most basic graph, a qualitative graph, is just describing a relationship between two quantities. And we want to see how that relationship changes over time. Usually over time, or as one variable goes up, the other variable may go up or may go down. And that's the basic idea. That, that's it. Um, so, you know, there are multiple answers because of that. Um, you know, there isn't just one, there is not always one answer. That means multiple answers are possible. Or I should say multiple graphs are possible. Um, you know, you shouldn't always assume that there's just one answer here because and you'll see what I mean when we look at some examples but you know just to illustrate my point what do we mean by a relationship between two quantities um, well let's look at this example here so this example describes the relationship since the year 1985 Michael Jordan has endorsed a successful line of shoes called Air Jordans or Air Jordan we're gonna let one variable we're gonna let P be the re retail price in dollars of Air Jordans. So I'll, you know, I'll underline the the description of the variables in the problem. So we're going to let P be the retail price in dollars of Air Jordans, and we're going to let T be the number of years since the year 1985. Now, one thing you'll have to be aware of, and this is true in not just qualitative graphs, but graphs in general, you want to know, you want to be able to understand the variables and what they're defined to be. That's important. You want to know what the variables represent. So, you know, if you look here, we're letting T be the number of years since 1985, not the actual year itself, but the number of years. So, I emphasize that here. For example, when t equals 1, well, since 1 represents the number of years since 1985, this is referring to the year 1986, because that's one year after 1985, obviously. 
So understanding what the variables are defined as is very important. Okay, so now that we know what the variables are, we want to see the relationship between those variables. So, you know, based upon the qualitative graph below, which is right here, what does it tell us? That is what kind of relationship exists between the variables. So the T variable, I'll just emphasize it here, is right here, and the P variable is here. So if we look at the graph, when we, when we start at this point right here, this point is called the origin. Um, when we start at this point, and as we go to the right, the T variable is increasing. This means it's increasing. That's an increasing value of T. It means it's getting bigger. And if we go up on the in the P direction, that's increasing as well. Right? And similarly, if we go to the left in the T direction, that's decreasing. And if we go down, that's decreasing. But we'll talk more about that later. When we talk about qualitative graphs, we don't really look at the left or the down direction because that implies negative. We'll talk about that later. Um, so if we look at these, if we look at this graph, what kind of relationship is going on? So as T gets bigger, right, as we go from the origin to the right, as T increases, what is P doing? Well, P is increasing as well because it's going up. Because if I look here, right, if I, if I look here, I start here, but then as I go to the right, P is up here as well. So that's going up as well as T goes to the right. So as T is increasing, P is also increasing. So as one increases, the other increases. In other words, as T increases, P also increases. So, but what kind of relationship exists? What kind of relationship exists? Well, and we'll talk more about this in chapter one, but see how this is going up at a, you know, it's going up at a steady rate and it doesn't go up like really quickly or it doesn't wiggle or do anything weird. It just goes up at a nice steady pace. Well, in mathematical terms, so what kind of relationship exists between the variables? So, in mathematical terminology, since this is going up at a steady rate, increases at a, I'll say, steady rate. Well, in mathematics, Steady usually implies constant, and you're going to hear that word a lot in this chapter. Um, and if steady rate otherwise known as a constant rate. And the big idea here is, this is the big thing you want to understand. If things are increasing at a constant rate, a steady rate, constant rate, they're kind of the same thing. Constant rate means linear, and that's exactly what this is. This is a graph of a line. You know, that's a straight line. A straight line is a constant rate. So basically, to answer this question as efficient as possible, what kind of relationship exists? A linear relationship. Therefore, T and P have a linear relationship. And that's the important thing to note here, is that T and P have a linear relationship. And that right there, linear, that word, is all we're really going to be looking at in Chapter 1. Um, all the properties of linear graphs, linear equations, and plotting linear plots, and so on and so forth. That's that's chapter one, really. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, as one variable increases, the other one increases here. That's going up. Now, linear could have a 
downward trend, that's fine as well. The important thing to note here is that if it's constant, whether it's going up or down, it's going to be linear. Linear, constant, constant, linear. They go back and forth. They're the same thing. Um, so, yeah. So, and that makes sense, right? Because if you think about the variables, well, as the years go on since 1985, so 1986, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, blah, 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 what's happening to the price of the shoes? The price of the shoes keeps going up. Why? Well, you know, Michael Jordan was a pretty popular dude in the 80s and 90s. So anything he's going to sell is going to be more and more expensive. And that's pretty much why. That's the realistic interpretation of that uh, scenario. So, yeah, that's why they're increasing. Um, all right. Let's look at this question here. Which variable does not affect the other variable? And right, let's explain. Which variable does not affect the other variable? Like, how do I know that T, does T influence P or does P influence T? Which one? Which one is which or which one is the other? That right there is the next important concept we're going to look on the next page. And that is the relate. that's the difference between independent and dependent variables. Independent versus dependent variables. So, you know, if we have an authentic situation, we want to assume that the variables t and p are the variables and that p depends on t. So in the situation we are looking at, I'll flip, refer back to the first page, which variable influences the other? Well, the price of the shoe right, depends on what year you're looking at, right? depending on what year you're in, 1985, 1991, 1997, whatever. The price depends on the year you're looking at. So in that case, since the price depends on the time, or price depends on T or whatever, since price depends on time, P depends on the other variable. That's why P is the dependent variable. Because price, P, depends on time and t is the independent variable because if I change t if I change t at will it's not going to affect the price you know I what year I look at you know is basically independent of control I can control t at will You know, that's, I can control that variable. The variable you can control is the independent variable. The dependent variable is going to change depending on what happens to the independent variable. You know, as T changes, P is also going to change. That's why P is dependent. Um, so let's look at these uh, two examples here. For each situation, describe the independent and dependent variable. Okay. Uh, also, I apologize if there's a little bleeding in the, you know, in the paper. It is what it is. <laughs> um, but if you're ever confused about anything, don't be afraid to email me. Okay, um, so situation one. You're waiting in line to go to a concert. Let T be the number of minutes you must wait. So I'll highlight the variables. T is the number of minutes you must wait. And let N be the number of people ahead of you when you first get in line. Which one's independent? Which one's dependent? Misspelled dependent. All right, so which one's which? Which one can I control? Which one depends on the other? Well, think about this situation, all right? 
so you have to actually think about the situation. Let's, so let T be the number of minutes you wait. All right. Now, one thing I see students confuse all the time is they assume time is always independent. That's not true. So I'll make a warning about that over here. Time is not always independent. You have to actually think about the situation. So if you think about it, all right, if you think n is the number of people ahead of you when you first get in line. In other words, how long you're going to wait depends on how many people are in the line, right? The length of time you wait depends on how many people are in line. So based upon that, which one's which? T depends on N. The time you wait depends on how many people are in the line. So T is dependent. All right, that's the number of minutes you must wait. And by extension, the independent variable, and you know, that's the variable you can control, is the number of people in line, or number of people ahead of you. All right, the fewer people, the less you're gonna wait. The more people, the longer you're gonna wait. And that, that's it. You know, just don't, 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 you know, this, this warning symbol here is very important. You should definitely, don't just assume that time is independent, you know, because it's not. You know, sometimes, most of the time it is, but here's a case where it isn't. So just be careful about that. All right, number two. N is the number of times a person can lift dumbbells. That way, W pounds. Okay. Um, well, which one's which? So, <clears throat> the number of times a person can lift dumbbells. All right, which one depends on which? So, if you think about it, N is the number of times I could lift, you know, if you're in the gym and you're doing weight training or whatever, um, you know, the heavier something is, generally, the fewer times you're going to lift it, right? The lighter something is, the more times you're going to lift it. That makes sense, right? Because the heavier, you know, things that are heavier are going to take, you know, more effort, so you're not going to do it as much. Whereas things that are lighter take less effort, so you'll be able to do it more. So, you know, which one depends on which? Well, the number of times you lift it depends on how heavy it is. That makes sense. So based upon that, N depends on the weight. So that means N is dependent and the weight is independent. So this is the weight of dumbbells. And N is the number of times a person can lift the dumbbell. That's it. You know, you know, if something weighs 10 pounds, you might be able to lift it, I don't know, 30 times. If something weighs 50 pounds, you might be able to lift it 10 times or whatever. And, you know, if something weighs 100 pounds, you might only lift it twice, you know. The bigger this gets will influence this. That's why this depends on this. And you could choose. You can control the weight of the dumbbells. You could choose the weight on your own. You could control that. Remember, control, that big word there. All right, so let's look at another example here. Let's look at, you know,
that's all we're doing in this first section is looking at the relationship that exists between two variables. Now, now that we know what independent and dependent variables are, we can identify them on a graph. And this is true on qualitative graphs and on, you know, plotting graphs, which we'll see soon. The independent variable is always on the horizontal axis. So the independent variable, this is T, and the dependent variable here is A. I, I just rewrote them because they might have been looking a little light there. So this is the independent variable. And this one's dependent. That's always the case. The one you control is on the horizontal. The one you cannot control, the one that depends on you, dependent, is on the vertical axis. All right, so let A be the average age in years when men first marry, and let T be the number of years since the year 1900. The graph below describes the relationship between the variables T and A. What does the graph tell us? So based upon this graph, as T increases, what is A doing? Well, A is initially decreasing, right? Until at some point here, you know, some number of years after the year 1900, it starts to level off and then it starts to increase again. So what does this graph tell us? So this is decreasing right here. So from like this point right here, this point right here, which by the way has a specific name, it's the A intercept. We'll talk about intercepts. We'll talk about them soon, but we can hold off on that for now. But basically an intercept is just where it crosses the axis. Um, so from the A intercept to somewhere here, I'll just put a mark here. In this little piece right here, the graph is decreasing. And from here on out, and this keeps going on forever, this is increasing. Now I do want you to notice here, is this a linear relationship? It is not, because linear is straight. Linear is straight. Um, yes, I'm using a gift card to make a ruler, don't judge me. This is linear, because it's a straight line. Whereas this is not linear, because it has a curve to it. And we'll talk about what kind of curve this is a little bit later in the class. Actually, this is polynomial, but well, specifically it's quadratic, but we'll talk about that much later. Anyway, all we have to do is describe the relationship. So the description. Um, so initially, so after the year 1900, the average age in years when men first marry, you know, as the years go on, so I'll just say this, after 1900, the average age when men first marry begins to decrease or I could just say decreases however at some point it begins to increase again So I'll just say at some point after 1900, because we don't know exactly, this could re represent 1910, 1920, 1930, we don't know. I'll just say this. After, however, at some point after 1900, the average age 
of men first marrying begins to increase. So, you know, this is a description of that situation. Now, you know, let's think about this. Like, you know, this isn't just a made-up scenario. This actually has, you know, some realistic interpretations. Um, if you think about it, you know, this could be the year 1930. Was there any, you know, was there any um, significant event that took place around the year 1930 that could have changed when people, well, men specifically, were first getting married? Well, yeah, there's a few events. Uh, World War II, for example. You know, this could be a description of World War II between average age of men marrying and the year 1900. Or it could be the Great Depression. Because, you know, a lot of those things could influence the average age of men getting married. You know, if it's World War II, there's fewer men in the country, so because most of them are fighting the war, so not many, not as many are getting married. If it's the Great Depression, you know, families or men aren't so enthusiastic to get married because they don't have as much money to get married, and you know, marriage and families is expensive. So, you know, there's a lot of different scenarios that could describe this graph. But, you know, since we don't, since this is a qualitative graph, we don't have tick marks on here. We don't know what the units are. And that's okay. We're just interpreting the, de, you know, the description between the variables. We don't know exactly what caused it. But, yeah, that's it. That's, that's just a description of what's going on. So, let's go on to page three here. So, what we're going to do now is, you know, we kind of interpreted what a given graph represents, but now what we're going to do is we're going to draw our own graph given this uh, situation. So we're actually going to, you know, we're going to flip, we're going to flip the uh, scenario around a bit. So, all right. So in this example, now keep in mind, at the beginning of this section I said multiple qualitative graphs are possible. However, there are certain things you could do that would automatically be considered wrong. But as long as you get those things right, any deviation from that could be considered right. So in this one, we have hot coffee being poured into a cup at room temperature. We're letting F be the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit of a coffee at T minutes since the coffee was poured. So F is the temperature of the coffee. And T is the number of minutes, or T minutes, since the coffee was poured, same thing. So, before we make our graph, this is a qualitative graph. Before we make our graph, we have to identify what? We have to identify the independent and dependent variables. So that way we know which one goes where. So which one's independent, which one's dependent? Well, which one controls the other? Well, the temperature of the coffee, since the coffee was poured, so if you think about it, when you brew your coffee in the morning or whatever, you go to Dunkin' Donuts to get coffee, you know, the, the coffee is at a certain temperature in the cup. But as it sits there, it's going to start doing what? It's going to start cooling down. So. In that case, which one depends on the other? The temperature depends on how long it was sitting in the cup. So the temperature, so F is the temperature, so this one depends how long it was in the cup, right? So the temperature is dependent on the time it sits in the cup. So now that I know, so this is the temperature, I'll just write temp for short, and T is time, or in other words, minutes. Um, so now that I know which one's which, well which axis is the independent go on? It goes on the horizontal one. And dependent goes on the vertical. And so now that I know that, 
I want to label my axes. What does T represent? Use the description in the problem. T is the minute since coffee was poured. And F is the temperature of coffee at T minutes. And I went out of focus, hold on. There we go. So now that we have independent, dependent, identified, we have them labeled on our axis, and we have a description of the uh, variables. Now we could draw our qualitative graph. So think about the situation. What's going on here? As T increases, so on a qualitative graph, the independent variable is going to be increasing, right, in the situation. It doesn't make sense for T to decrease because we can't reverse time. Um, so at the moment you pour the cup of coffee, that's right here. That's when T is at its smallest value. Because as T goes up, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. This could be one minute, two minute, three minute. We don't know the increments. We just know that it increases. So as T increases, so the coffee sits there longer as this gets bigger. Right? As this goes over, this just means the coffee sitting in your cup longer. What happens to the temperature of the coffee? It's going to cool down. Right? So, I have to figure out a starting point here, right? So, you know, if I pick a starting point here, or if I pick a starting point up here, or if I pick a starting point up here, all three of them would be considered correct because that would suggest that the coffee has some temperature, right? Now, generally, when you pour a cup of coffee, it's going to be hot, unless you get a cold coffee, which is stupid, because cold coffee is stupid. Ha, ha, ha. I'm just kidding. So generally, you know, I'm going to, you know, when you pour a cup of coffee, it's going to be pretty hot. So if I have a high temperature, it's going to be up here somewhere. So this is an acceptable starting point. But then again, you could pick down here, you could pick down here, they're okay, all right? The only thing that wouldn't be considered good is if you did that. If you did that, that would be considered wrong because that would imply that once you pour the cup of coffee, it has no temperature, which is not physically possible. All right, so now let's draw our graph. So as T gets bigger, Trust me, there's not $25 on this gift card. I used it up. Um, as T gets bigger, what's the temperature of the coffee doing? Well, as it sits there, it's going to cool down. So as T increases, the temperature is going to decrease. So that's going to start going down, right? My marker would work. So it's going to do something like that, all right? It's going to start going down as the time increases. Now, is it going to continuously go down forever and ever? No, because it's at room temperature, right? It's not in a freezer. It's not in a refrigerator. You know, if your cup of coffee sits on your kitchen table, it's not going to freeze into a block. That doesn't make sense. It's going to meet the room temperature. So at some point, the temperature is going to stop decreasing and it's going to do what? It's going to level off. It's going to remain the same as its environment. So at some point, it's going to start slowing down. It could be gradual, it could be constant, but at some point it's going to start leveling off and then it's going to start being constant. Alright, so that's that's a qualitative graph to describe this situation. So in this interval right here, I'll kind of, I'll describe this piece of the interval as coffee cools off, you know, in this piece. But at some point, you know, in this little guy, in this little chunk right here, 
it's slowing down or in other words it cools off less and then from here on out forever and ever all right that's the word less from here on out the coffee is it's the same temperature as the environment it's done cooling in other words the coffee is at a constant temperature it's not moving anymore um, so yeah that's a qualitative graph that describes that relationship <laughs> and again if this were all shifted down a little bit because if you chose this as your starting point that's okay just as long as you don't pick that as your starting point and that's it for that problem um, now let's look at this one so this situation looks at well this is the sale of a video game that will be released in the year 2019 okay so let n be the number of copies that will be sold if a dollars are spent on advertising and then sketch a relationship so all right let's do the same thing identify the variables describe the axes and then draw your graph all right which one's which So, <clears throat> excuse me. If I sound a little muddled, it's because my air conditioning kicked on again. Um, so let N be the number of copies that will be sold if A dollars are spent on advertising. Um, So which one depends on the other? <clears throat> well, the number of copies that will be sold depends on how much you spend on advertising, right? So in that case, N is dependent, and how much you spend on advertising is independent. So that's the dollars spent, and this is number of copies. sold okay so independent that's on the a-axis and that's the dollar spent on advertising and lowercase n is the number of copies sold So let's think about this. The more you spend on advertising, right? What's going to happen to your number of copies? Now, let's think about a starting point, right? So the vertical line there is how many copies can I sell when I didn't spend anything on advertising? So this right here represents the number of copies sold when I spent zero dollars on advertising. Think about that. Is it possible to start here, here, or at the origin? In other words, are there multiple starting points? And the answer is yes, there are multiple starting points. And yes, you could start down here. You could conceivably not sell anything when you didn't spell anything on advertising. But you could also sell something when you didn't spend on advertising 
you could do either one or the other. That is possible in this situation, whereas in this one it wasn't. This one it is. You could start down here, you could start here, you could start here. They're all possibilities. So I'm just going to pick a starting point. I'm going to pick it at the origin for the sake of explaining that, just so you're not confused. You could sell copies when spending nothing on advertising. That is possible. So I'm just going to emphasize that there. All right, so as you spend more, um, as you spend more on advertising, what do you think is going to happen to the number of copies? Well, your, you know, your product is going to get out there. People are going to hear about it more, so generally, more and more copies are going to get sold. So this is going to increase. Could it increase linearly? Probably. But we could it increase at a different rate? Probably, but we don't know more than that. We just know it increases. So let me, it's going to increase and increase, but what's going to happen? Or let me say this, what could happen? At some point, you spend so much on advertising, what's going to happen to the number of copies? It's going to level out again, just like it did up here. At some point, you're going to spend more on advertising, but you know, everybody's buying copies, buying copies, but eventually a lot of people, you know, the more you spend on the advertising, the number of copies is going to start leveling off again, right? Now, the long-term behavior, the more you spend on advertising, well, at some point, you know, you're going to continue, you're going to hit a maximum value of copies you're going to sell because people know about your product. It's out there. You don't have to advertise anymore. So at some point, it's going to level off again. In other words, you know, this is a business term. You've saturated the market. You know, if you over advertise, people know about your product. You're wasting money. No need to advertise. So, you know, this is a possibility. But you could also, you could also see a decrease here. Right? The number of copies that are sold could start to decrease again. Um, you know, because we don't know more than this basic relationship, this is a perfectly acceptable graph. And that's that's a good part right there. So I'm going to, you know, that's a perfectly fine qualitative graph. Any more than this isn't wrong. It's just you don't know enough information to make that conclusion. So this is perfectly fine. So this piece right here is... copies sold increases in that little piece it copies sold levels off and in this little piece you know that keeps going on or could go down in this little piece you've saturated the market or I could say number of copies sold levels off to a constant amount and you know that's the basic idea um, you know when it comes to drawing a qualitative graph just remember variations of this graph or this graph are also correct. But that doesn't mean they can't be wrong. Like, you know, I'll emphasize. I'll re-emphasize this again. You cannot do there. Do not start here. You cannot start here. That would mean that the temp the coffee has no temperature, which is not possible. All right, so the last page of these notes, which is on the reverse side, again, I know it's bleeding here. I'll see if I could change that up going forward. But this is just a, a rundown of all the things you should do when you're describing the relationship between variables.
Um, you should always use complete sentences. Um, don't be vague. You know, don't do things like one variable goes up, the other one goes down. That's stupid. You have to be specific. Be specific. Let me go back to page one. Notice how when I did this problem, I was specific about the variables. I didn't say things like one goes up, the other one goes down. I don't know what you're talking about. So don't do it here. Um, you know, I just I emphasize that right here. X is getting bigger, Y is getting smaller. Don't do that. So just be as detailed as possible. And you know, this is the basic relationship we're going to look at in this chapter. Uh, well, I mean that's as basic as it gets when it comes to looking at relationships between variables. You know, identifying independent, dependent, but going forward now we're going to, you know, that's as basic as it gets. So going forward we're going to actually start looking at mathematical properties of, you know, linear relationships, straight lines. Um, and yeah, that's what we're going to start looking at in the next few sections. So that's it for section 1.1.